All right, let's go ahead and open up to Romans 9. Very critical section. Uh, we're going to uh, finish up, hopefully. I always say that, and then I never quite make it through. Uh, but we're going to try and make it through the vessels here. I'm using it also as a uh, little bit of an opportunity to look at some of Israel's uh, history, uh, which, of course, we covered in great detail in the Matthew study. But here it has a, a major application here in Romans 9. And remember where we're at here. He's given us eight chapter, chapters of wonderful doctrine, all those things that are true of us. He's taken us from chapter one in which we were completely separate from God and his plans and purposes, completely apart from God, way back in chapter one. And then we get to chapter, the end of chapter eight, and we're completely and eternally united to God, together with God. Nothing, he says, can separate us from God and his love. And then he has to break in at that point and because there's something very critical. Uh, everything he says in that first eight chapters hinges on how he answers the question he answers in Romans 9 to 11. What happened to national Israel? Depending on how you answer that question will depend on whether you throw away the first eight chapters of Romans or you embrace it and relish it and praise God and thank God for it. If you answer it the way historic Christianity for the most part has answered it, that God is permanently done with Israel, that God has thrown Israel aside, that God has replaced Israel with the body of Christ, and that God, therefore God is permanently done with Israel, well, they don't realize it, but what you have to do also is throw away the first eight chapters of Romans. Because if God wasn't faithful, trustworthy, and righteous in his dealings with the nation of Israel, and well, how could we ever expect him to be faithful, righteous, and truthful with us in the body of Christ, the mystery program, the body of Christ? Everything hinges on this. It's all uh, in, in this. And what Paul is going to explain is it's not a permanent casting away. It's a temporary casting away. And so as we work our way through chapter 9 here, uh, we saw that uh, God has cast away the bulk of the nation. But that doesn't mean he's unfaithful because he continues to work at the time Paul was writing this with a believing remnant. And that doesn't make God unfaithful. That's how God created the nation. It wasn't all Abraham's sons, all Abraham's children. It was the, the line through the miraculous line of Isaac and Jacob, the faith child Isaac and the grace Grace child Jacob, and that's the line he's going to use. That's how he created the nation, through remnant theology. And it's, uh, he's not unrighteous, uh, using the time of Israel's fall, Israel's unrighteousness, Israel's unfaithfulness, as an opportunity to display his righteousness, to display his compassion and kindness and goodness and grace and mercy. He's not unrighteous to do that, to take advantage of their unrighteousness to do that. That's what he did back at the Golden Calf Incident, when he should have gone down the mount and destroyed them, consumed them. Instead, he said, no, I'm going to hold back my wrath and judgment a little while longer. And I'm going to use their rebelliousness as an opportunity to display my compassion and kindness. And then he went to Pharaoh and he, he said, now, during this time when I, instead of coming in my wrath and judgment, I'm displaying my kindness and goodness and grace and mercy while I carry out another purpose. He's put Israel's prophetic program on hold. He's postponed it while he carries out another purpose to make his name and power known in the world. And the Jews can't complain about that either because that's exactly what he did back in the Exodus account. He uh, postponed the deliverance of Israel while he carried out another purpose through Pharaoh. And so he goes through these step by step showing what he's doing today uh, through the apostleship of Paul and he's driving home the point this is all consistent with the way God has operated in the past. And therefore, he's, it's a, a allowable or it's, it's 
uh, doesn't call into question his character uh, to, for him to do that now through the apostleship of Paul. And then we get into these vessels here. So let's just begin with here. We'll pick these up. We've already covered uh, most of the first couple here. So I'm not going to go through these all again. But let's just look at, just to have the whole list here, there's four different vessels mentioned here. Two are in the singular. I think that's important. The, one in the, the first one we have in the singular, let's go and read uh, verse, verse 21. This is Romans 9, verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So we have a vessel of dishonor. And last week we looked at that uh, and we saw that goes really back. Uh, Jeremiah 18 is where that's drawn out. He brings in the potter uh, example there, illustration there. Uh, and that's at the beginning of that fifth course of punishment with that Babylonian captivity. He's been trying to turn them into a vessel of honor and they, keep, they don't respond to the guidance of his hands. They don't respond uh, to what he's trying to get them to do. And so he, in the first course of punishment, let's just go back. Let's go back here. In this fifth first course of punishment, he puts them on the mold. He's trying to form them into a vessel of honor and they rebel and he squashes the clay down and he tries again the second and the third and the fourth course of punishment. Squash, 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 who try again, try again, try again. And they refuse, this clay refuses to obey. Uh, it doesn't follow the guidance of his hands. He can't use them. And so he's free to say, well, then this is going to be a pot or a, a, a vessel uh, that is going to be used for common everyday things. It's not going to be a vessel of honor. It's going to be a vessel of dishonor. And in that fifth course of punishment with the Babylonian captivity, he's going to take now, he's not going to work with it anymore. He's going to go back to his place and he's going to put them under Gentile control. He's going to take the pot and he's going to sell it for a low cost, a nickel, let's say, uh, to the traveling Gentile caravan. And they're going to be carried off by the Babylonians. And all the way to what we're studying in Matthew here, uh, they're still under Gentile rule. And of course, that won't end till out, out here at Christ's second coming. So that's where those, uh, that vessel of dishonor, nation of Israel and apostasy, especially that fifth course of punishment, uh, and God is going to cast them away in that transition period. We'll look at this a little bit later today. In that transition period, in the Acts period, uh, Paul wrote this. Uh, God cast them away and was ready to, and when he returns, out here at his return, along with the Gentiles, he's going to shatter the pottery. The shatter the apostate nation, shatter the vessel of the gen the vessels of the Gentiles, and he's going to bring in. Let's look at our next vessel here, a vessel of honor. That's that believing remnant we've been working with in Matthew. He's going to bring. He's going to call out of the vessel of dishonor. He's going to call out the nation of Israel and apostasy. He's going to call out a believing remnant, and he's going to turn them into a vessel of honor. And that's what we're going to look at next here. That's the nation of Israel and faith uh, at Christ's second coming. Israel has been, and we can look at Exodus 19, 5, 6, at the very first point uh, God had brought them out to be his nation, he said they were supposed to be a treasure unto him. You know, that's kind of like a vessel of honor. They're supposed to be a treasure. They're supposed to be a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation his special vessel of honor. Uh, and God will ultimately form in Israel into a permanent vessel of honor, honor out of the clay of sinful humanity of that believing remnant of Israel. He's still going to use the descendants of Abraham through the line of Isaac and Jacob. Remember back in, uh, I think it was Romans 9, 6, he's, he, the principle for everything he's saying is not all Israel is Israel. There's two requirements to be a member of Israel in God's sight. Maybe not in man's sight, but in God's sight. Yes, you have to be uh, naturally through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
That's one, that's the natural line. But there's a second requirement that makes you a part of God's Israel. And that's being a spiritual progeny of Abraham, following in the footsteps of their father Abraham, believing what God said, receiving in faith what God said, so that God would uh, count their faith for righteousness, just like he did with Abraham, and justify them before his tribunal. It's only after they've been justified before his tribunal as ungodly sinners on enemy status before God, like Abraham was. It's only after that that he can take them now and put them in that believing remnant and be part of his true Israel. Yes, the natural descendants of Abraham, but also the spiritual descendants of Abraham through faith. And he's going to take them out here at this time uh, at his return. He's going to form them into his people here. When Christ returns through that, the fiery judgments and all that, they're going to come out of that a preserved and purified people. And when he returns, he's going to usher them into the land, plant them in the land, and create from them that nation of Israel. And we've been talking a lot about that in our Matthew study. And that will be that kingdom of God on earth. Let's just look at uh, one example, what it's going to be like in those days. Go to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. And this is what that, this kingdom is going to look like. Uh, and how they're going to be, my point is, this vessel of honor. Just think of it this way. Uh, the goal, what God always wanted to do with the nation of Israel is form her into a vessel of honor that he could go and put in the display cabinet of his museum on the earth where he could shine a light on it so the whole world could see. That's the end goal for Israel. The whole world will be blessed with Israel and through her rise. Look at what it says here in Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light. It's talking about here, it's specifically Zion, Jerusalem, uh, the nation of Israel as a whole. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, the gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. Again, I want to make sure we all understand he's talking about here the nation of Israel, Zion, Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, and his glory shall be a scene upon thee. That's that vessel of honor. He's going to form a vessel of honor out of that believing remnant. He's going to take it in this kingdom and he's going to put it up in his display cabinet uh, and shine a light on it. And through that light, it's going to display God's glory throughout the whole earth. All, to all the Gentiles, they'll come to that light. Let's keep reading. Uh, his glory is, shall be upon thee, verse 3, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. All the Gentiles are going to flow into that light. They're going to come. The Gentiles are out in the darkness, those faraway dark places. What's lit up is, the, is, is uh, Christ sitting on his throne in glory, lighting up Jerusalem, lighting up uh, Israel, and the whole, all the world, all the Gentile nations are going to come and worship him in his vessel of honor, the nation of Israel. Lift up thine eyes, verse 4, uh, around about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. All of Israel is going to be regathered uh, into the land. Then thou shalt see, verse 5, and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, Israel. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. That's what he's going to turn that believing remnant in. He's going to come bring his people that he creates uh, from, during this tribulation period, finishes creating during this tribulation period. He plants them in the land and he rebuilds and restores the nation, makes them into a vessel of honor that shines his light throughout the whole world. That's that vessel of honor concept. All right. Let's go and look at another vessel here. 
that. Now we can go to vessels plural. The first two were vessel singular. They had to do with the nation of Israel. Uh, the vessel of dishonor was the nation of Israel in apostasy and unbelief. Uh, and the vessel of honor was the nation of Israel, that believing remnant, in faith uh, and belief. Let's look at the next one. Now we have two that are vessels. Here we now have plural. Uh, this is talking about many vessels. So let's go ahead and pick it up here in verse 22. We're back to Romans 9, verse 22. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known? Uh, that's what you have to understand is the basis for all of this. If you don't understand uh, what that he, at the beginning of Romans, God was willing and ready. Well, not really the beginning of Romans, but at the time Christ was rejected by the nation in early Acts, God was willing to return in his wrath and judgment and put on his, display his power, not in a good way. I mean, a lot's not in a good way for sinners and, and enemies. He's gonna, he was gonna, he was willing, he was right to come and destroy all his enemies. Not just the Hitlers and the Stalins. See, it's so easy. If you didn't learn Romans 1 to 3, you might think, uh, you know, I'm, my neighbor's not an enemy. Uh, the, the guy next door, the nice person that bags my groceries, you know, God wouldn't do anything to them. It's just the Stalins and the Hitlers that God would have to deal with. So you, you are looking at things from man's perspective, not God's. That's why Romans 1 to 3 comes first, because he makes it clear there that he uh, is going to come back, is on the, ready to come back. It says in Romans 1 18, his wrath is revealed from heaven. It's revealed, but it hasn't come yet. He is ready and willing and able and right to come and destroy not just the Hitlers and the Stalins, the big Hitlers and the Stalins, but the little Hitlers and the Stalins too. You know, people like you and me who think we can control our own little world and the people around us uh, for our own purposes. See, if you just got rid of the big Hitlers and Stalins, what would happen within the next week, I guarantee you? You'd have someone else come and be the next Hitler and Stalin. And then you'd have someone else follow with that and follow. And we've seen that many times since then. See, when Christ returns to fix the world's problems, he's going to have to destroy and remove all wickedness, all evil, all rebellion, all, let me put it as, as succinctly as possible, all those who reject him and his gospel, his word, all unbelievers, all unsaved. He was willing and ready and he would have been right to do that. Israel joined arms with the nations, the Gentile nations, and hung the creator, the Messiah, the king, the savior on the cross. They shot off a nuclear bomb in the face of God, and they said, we will not have you involved with us. And God was ready, and we're going to look at this a little more carefully a little later. God was willing, it says here, he is willing to come and deal with the world's problems, all the evil in the world, but out of his grace and mercy and long-suffering kindness. Let's see what he did. Verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, what did he do instead? Endured with much long-suffering, riches of his suffering, the vessels of wrath that are, that are fitted are designated for destruction. He was ready, willing, and would have been right to come back and destroy all his enemies. But instead, he came back. He's holding back his wrath and judgment and destroying his enemies. He comes back, saves his chief enemy, and sends him out with good news of peace and grace to his enemies, offering them a day of salvation, an escape route. If they simply believe the message, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ for them, uh, they leave through 
the south gate. They go through a checkpoint. Uh, they won't, they'll be saved from, delivered from that coming wrath. And uh, it's important to realize, if you forget that side of the equation, then you're not going to think, you know, there's evil in the world. Why is, how can you, we say God's kind and long-suffering when he's allowing evil? He's allowing evil to continue because when he comes back to fix the evil, he's going to have to fix all of it. Everyone. Everyone that's rejected him, everyone that's rebelled against him, all unbelievers, all the unsaved, all his enemies... And instead, he came back in his grace and peace and endured with much, with the riches, he says in uh, Romans 2, 4, the riches of his long suffer. He, suffering. He's suffering long with the problems on the earth because he wants to wait as long as possible and offer this, extend this day of salvation as long as possible so that as many as possible might get saved before he returns in his wrath and judgment. Not just to destroy the Hitlers and the Stalins, but to, he, to destroy all who've rejected him and his word. And instead he came back and he's now endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted under destruction. If you don't understand that, then you're not going to have any place in your theology for Paul's apostleship, because that's what Paul's apostleship is. Everybody born in the world is born as an ungodly sinner on enemy status before God. God comes and confronts them with his gospel. In our case, it's the gospel of grace, the gospel, uh, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ. And those who believe it, their faith is counted for righteousness. They're justified unto eternal life and they are delivered from the coming wrath. Those who reject it, are, they remain designated, fitted as part of the vessels, as members of the vessels of wrath. And they'll be the recipients of that wrath. No, we, we want to maximize our time here getting out the gospel. Uh, fixing the world's problems isn't our issue right now. Right now, we have to go door to door, uh, person to person, extending the gospel so that they can be saved from the coming wrath when God does come to fix the problems of the world. So that's where we have this vessels. Here we have unbelieving national Israel and uh, the Gentile nations. Of course, the Gentile nations have always been uh, vessels of wrath before God going all the way back. Remember, you had the Tower of Babel, you got the, uh, the, the worldwide flood. All those times he's judged them in the past, trying to work with them. It says his spirit strove continually with them and they rejected him. And he's written them off, the Gentile nations. He let them go their way, Romans 1. Uh, and now Israel has gone her way. He, she joined hands at the, uh, at the stoning of Stephen uh, with the Gentile nations in rejecting God and his Christ and his Lord and, and the uh, creator of the universe and their Messiah and King. And so now they're grouped together with vessels of wrath along with the Gentiles. The nation of Israel was cast away among the vessels of wrath at the stoning of Stephen. And I think this is one thing we will take a little time to look at. Maybe we'll go back to Psalm 2 and look at that too, uh, just to kind of give you uh, what's going to happen in the grand finale. But let's look at when Israel became a vessel of wrath. Go back to the stoning of Stephen, uh, Acts 7. It's a long chapter. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. Uh, Stephen is presenting the history uh, to the vain religious system, the history of Israel to the vain religious system. And what one of the main things he's doing in this presentation is he's giving them, he's giving them an opportunity to receive Christ. He goes through a bunch of people and they, he shows them how Israel has always rejected God's spokesman the first time but then received him the second time. And we could just think of Moses. Remember at first, Moses was rejected. 
by the people, went out and became a shepherd uh, for his father-in-law, the Midianite. Uh, and then he, when he returned, though, they received him. The point is, Stephen's making it here, is they've rejected Christ and sent him away. But now is the time to receive them, receive him uh, the this, this second time. And he's giving them, through the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, this opportunity to receive Christ. The second time they rejected him, Christ and his earthly ministry, they have a second chance now to receive him through the ministry of Peter and the Twelve and the Holy Spirit. So that's all I'm gonna say in preparation for that big long chapter in chapter seven. What I wanna bring us up to uh, is of course we know uh, that the vain religious system didn't receive Stephen's offer. Let's see what they do, verse 54. Acts seven, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now this is, this is I find this very interesting because uh, if you're familiar with the beginning of Acts, there's another time people are cut to the heart. Go over to, just fl keep your finger here and just go back a couple pages to chapter two, verse 37. <clears throat> chapter two, verse 37, and here we have Peter's uh, a message, Peter's sermon at Pentecost here. And he goes through, through all this. We'll actually come back and look at a couple things here as we work our way through those last verses of Acts 7. But I just want to show you verse 37. Now, when they heard this, he's talking about Peter's sermon. When they heard this, they were pricked to the heart, cut to the heart. What does it say after they heard Stephen's, the people there who are listening to Stephen? They were cut to the heart too. God's word cut through and cut into their heart. But look at the two different responses. Verse 37, the response of the people uh, involved here with, to Peter's sermon was, now in, when they heard this, they were pricked to their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles and brethren, what shall we do? God's word pricked their heart and they responded in faith. Now go back to chapter seven. Verse 54, keep the, keeping that in mind, uh, in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut, pierced, cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They, uh, the word of God cut through their heart, but they responded in unbelief. Their, heart, their hearts became hardened even more hardened than they were before. Uh, the same message, basically Peter and Stephen are preaching the same basic message. I'm not saying it's a word for word, but the same best basic message here. And uh, the, God's word in this message they pre is preached to this group at Pentecost and their hearts were cut by the word of God. Remember the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierced the heart and they responded in faith. Their heart was softened in faith. That basically that same message is preached to these people at the stoning of Stephen and the word of God cut into their heart, pierced into their heart. But, they, but they're responding in unbelief. Their heart was hardened in unbelief. And they gnashed their teeth. They rejected him. And pretty soon they're going to stone him to death. So let's go through as we follow here. And in case you don't, can't, haven't made the connection yet, uh, that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 9, about uh, hardening and softening people's hearts, showing mercy. He Today he's... Uh, proclaiming his message of mercy, grace, and peace. And that's going to cut through a person's heart. But uh, what it's either going to soften the heart in faith, that could be the response, or that same message is going to harden the heart in unbelief. That's why he says to Pharaoh, uh, half the time it says God hardened his heart, and the other half of the time it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, which is it? Well, it's both. God hardened his heart indirectly. The same message Pharaoh preached to Moses. And that message cut into Moses' heart and softened it in faith. He preached that same message to Pharaoh. And it pierced his heart, only it hardened his heart in unbelief. It depends on the response of the person. Uh, Pharaoh, Moses received it in faith. And his heart was softened. 
Pharaoh received that same message, and his heart was hardened. That's what the word does. That's, you want to know why sometimes uh, you have re it receives the gospel of grace and some people don't and get violent over it even? Uh, I, you wouldn't believe some of the messages I've had and emails and, and conversations uh, because that same message pierces into the heart. It's going to pierce into everybody's heart. But it, it, when it pierces in the heart based on the response of the person, it either softens it in faith or it hardens it in unbelief. And here we have a case of hardening in unbelief. Verse 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, look, <coughs> this is Stephen, Stephen looked up steadfastly into heaven. So he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's looking up into heavens and the heavens are going to open. Uh, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And notice how he says this two times. So this is important. He's not just repeating it uh, for the sake of it. He's driving home a point here. And this is what we want to look at. And saw the glory of God, verse 55, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So just think a few different things here. We're going to take them piece by piece. Uh, that glory of God concept. And then also standing at the right hand of God concept. Uh, and really drive home this point. Now one thing I want you to get out of your mind is if you've uh, devotionalized this passage and you think Jesus is standing uh, with arms open to receive uh, Stephen up into heaven... See, that's not what's happening here. They don't devotionalize God's word. Uh, Stephen has the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to make sure he gets to heaven, uh, on it, it, uh, heaven and, or wherever he needs to be uh, after this death experience. He's going to ensure he's eternally secure and he's going to take care of him. That's not why Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father here. To understand that, let's go back again to Acts 2. And let's just see how Peter left it. Look what Peter uh, writes here in Acts 2. Look at Acts 2 verse, oh, let's pick it up at, um, let's pick it up at verse 33. Of course, he's talking about Jesus here. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted. Okay, so now he's introducing, to, here we have Jesus at the right hand of God. Now let's get some more of the details. But he saith himself, the, Lord, or, uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. For David, verse 34, is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself. And now he quotes from a psalm. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. So now we have here uh, Peter, when Peter does, this is about a year before Stephen's message, before Stephen gets stoned, this is about a year before that. And when Peter's talking about it, he's told that what's going on in heaven is Jesus is next to the Father, but he's sitting. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now, how long is he going to be sitting? And what does he do when he's not sitting anymore? Look at verse 35. So now he's sitting, according to Peter, at the, about a year before this encounter with Stephen, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Look at verse 35. And, and how long is this going to be? Until I make thy foes thy footstool. He's going to stay sitting until he gets up, till he stands to make his enemies his footstool until he comes to stomp his enemies under his feet when he comes in his wrath and judgment to destroy his enemies. He's sitting a year before Stephen and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he, when he stands up, it doesn't, he's not standing up to welcome Stephen uh, into heaven. Uh, he's standing up because he's in full war regalia 
He's in full, he's got a missile under each arm. He's fully decked out. He's got a semi-automatic, his helmet on, and he's coming to destroy his enemies. That's what Pete, or excuse me, what Stephen sees. That's why Stephen cries out, don't hold this against him. He knows what's going on. Jesus is standing now. He's going to come back in his wrath and judgment, and he's going to destroy his enemies, beginning with these people stoning him. Beginning, let's see who it's going to begin with. Go back to chapter 7. Chapter 7. Then they cried out, verse 57, with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, now get this, this is his last uh, gasp of breath. These are his last words. He's being stoned to death. He's on the verge of death. And he cries out, he screams out, he yells out with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And he fell asleep. His last words, what he saw about to happen in the heavenlies was horror striking. Lord, don't uh, hold this against them. Don't come back and do this to them. What he's seen is the horror of what's about to come. Jesus Christ had gone from sitting to standing in full war regalia, and he's coming down, and he's coming down to destroy his enemies, beginning with the young man's feet. We see here Saul, beginning with Saul, consumed. Those stoning Stephen, consumed. The rest of apostate Israel, consumed. The unbelieving Gentile realms, consumed. There's another part to this uh, war concept, this wrath concept. Go back to verse 55, and notice how he introduces us, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and look what else he saw. Not only was the Lord Jesus standing, ready to come back in his wrath and judgment, the destroyer, the warrior, but there's something else he sees too. He looks up and he sees the glory of God. Now, uh, it's important to realize that we do talk about certain aspects of the glory of God. That's what our purpose is, to display God's glory on earth. But when it talks about in this passage, it's talking about uh, other, another way and another reference to God's glory. And for that, let's go back and look at a couple and you'll see how this ties together. One verse from Matthew 16, maybe some of you even remember it from when we were there. Matthew 16, verse 27. We're, we're uh, going to look at something uh, that uh, kind of is happening here uh, at the stoning of Stephen. This is what Stephen expected to happen. Verse 27, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. Does that sound a little bit like what he said over, uh, Stephen said, as he's being stoned? With his angels. All right, keep that in mind. Go over to chapter 25, verse 31. Chapter 25, verse 31 of Matthew. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. This uh, concept of this glory, when Christ comes, when Christ returns in his wrath and judgment, when he stands to come and implement to, to what Peter says, uh, trample his enemies under his feet, make his foes his footstool. He's going to come, not alone, he's going to come with the angelic armies. 
they're going to be uh, uh, surrounding him. He, Stephen looks up and he sees Jesus is standing. He's decked out in full war regalia. He's ready to come back in wrath and he's leading the angelic armies to come down. And all the targets are on planet Earth. And he's going to take care of all the problems on the Earth. And he's going to remove all wickedness and all evil and all those that reject him and his word. That's what Stephen saw. And that's why Stephen cries out with his last gasp. He sees the horror, the wrath, the judgment that's coming. Don't hold this against them. Christ, what he, uh, Stephen expected him to do is to come back with the angelic armies, begin by destroying Saul, then those around stoning him, then apostate Israel, and then especially all those God-rejecting, idolatrous Gentile nations. That's what he expected. When you read in, Matthew, in uh, Romans 9, we read that, God was, this is the point uh, Paul is talking about, God was willing and ready and right to come back in his wrath uh, and display his power in destroying his enemies. But instead, he endured with much long suffering, with the riches of his long suffering. And instead, you know what he did? He was supposed to come back and uh, in his wrath and judgment and consume, starting, consume all his enemies, beginning with Saul, going to the nation, the apostate nation of Israel, and on to the idolatrous Gentile nations of the world. But you know what he did instead? He came back, but he saved Saul and commissioned him to send a message out to the apostate nation and all the Gentile realm that this is a day of salvation. God's holding back his wrath and judgment a little while longer, and the very per first person he should have destroyed, he saved. That's the riches of his long-suffering goodness and kindness. Let's see how Paul describes this himself. Go over to uh, first, uh, Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and we'll see this all tied together here as well. Second Thessalonians, chapter one. Second Th Thessalonians, chapter one, verse seven. <clears throat> All right, so we're not going to get into the background. I just want to bring out what, when Christ returns, what he's going to return with and how it fits into Acts 7 and how it's the basis for Romans 9. And to you, uh, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. What, is, what just happened with Stephen in Acts 7? The heavens opened up and the Lord Jesus reve was revealed and he's standing and shall be revealed from heaven. It's going to be with his mighty angels. There's that glory of God with the angelic uh, armies. When he returns in his wrath and judgment, he's going to come with those angelic armies. He's going to be leading them in the path of destruction. Verse 8. Well, what about the, uh, let's see what this is described as, especially this angelic host. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Does it say here, taking vengeance on just the worst of all the bad people, just the worst of all the evil people by some human standard? No, it's by all those who don't know God. Now the idea here is they is not that they innocently don't know God. That God has made himself known to them and they rejected it. In that sense, they don't if they don't know God because they've rejected him. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody. It's not just the ones, you know, if you, if you, if you kill, you know, 100,000 people or more, then God needs to come and take care of you and all the rest of us are pretty good. You know, forget all those human standards. When he comes, he's going to have to deal with everyone who's rejected him and his word. 
in his wrath and judgment. But of course, Paul makes the announcement, you don't have to do that. Just receive the good news, his day of amnesty, day of salvation, his the, use the opportunity when he's being long-suffering, enduring with much long-suffering, suffering long his enemies on this earth, so that as many as possible can be saved before he comes back in his wrath and judgment. Remember, these Thessalonians are under severe persecution. And he's saying the goal for this uh, time of God's long suffering, it's, it's opening a door of salvation, a door of escape. God's holding back that wrath and judgment, opening a door of escape so that all who believe on his son uh, and the gospel of grace, the good news of the death and resurrection of his son on that cross for sinners, for us, we leave through the south checkpoint. We'll be raptured away and then he comes back. He'll pick up right with the scene that Stephen saw. He'll stand up. He had full war regalia and he'll lead his arm, his angelic armies here as a flaming fire, it says in verse 8, taking vengeance on all who've rejected him, all rebels, all who've refused his good news, his long, he've used his long suffering to continue in, in sin and rejection of him. All right. So that's the, the nation of Israel was cast away at the stoning of Stephen. It becomes a vessel of wrath uh, and join, because they join hand with the other vessels of wrath. The Gentile nations have been the vessels of wrath uh, going all the way back. Uh, but uh, Israel became a, went from an, a vessel of dishonor to just one of the vessels of wrath at the stoning of Stephen. All right, let's get this last vessel in. Go back to Romans 9. Uh, Romans 9. And let's read this last one. Here we have another plural. So what's he doing instead? If that's what he should have come and done to the vessels of wrath, what's he doing now? He's endured, verse 22, with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That's what he's doing today. You want to know why there's evil in the world? You don't need to get an advanced theological degree. You don't need to go to three seminaries and, and have all this or become a philosophical major or a philosophy major or anything like that. Here's the simple reason. The reason there's evil in the world is because God is enduring it with much long suffering. Because if he came back to get rid of it, he'd have to come back and get rid of all of it. And he's holding back. He's letting the world, he's suffering long with his enemies so that he can save them before he comes back to destroy them. Verse 23, and what's he doing instead? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. Now he's taking uh, all, he's, he's the nations from a nation standpoint, the apostate nation of Israel has joined hands with the Gentile nations of the earth in declaring uh, their rebellion against God. We won't have him reign over us. And now God is using that rebellion. You remember the golden calf incident? Just like the golden calf, he's using their rebelliousness, their unrighteousness, their sinfulness, and he's using them uh, as instead of as an opportunity to come back and consume them in his wrath and judgment, he's using this time as an opportunity to display the riches of his long-suffering goodness and kindness and mercy and grace and peace. He's calling out now from the vessels of wrath, individuals the, that are nations, individuals. He's calling out of the, he, he's especially addressing these Jews that are a part, these are unbelieving Jews. They're still a part of that apostate nation. And he's calling these individual Jews out of that apostate nation. He's calling individual Gentiles out of their apostate nations. And he's calling them and he's, make, he's uh, dispensing on them. He's making them 
vessels of mercy. He puts them on his pottery uh, table uh, and it goes around and around and he takes each individual and he works and he guides them with his gospel of grace, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ. And when they respond in faith, he takes that vessel of mercy and puts it in the, another vessel of honor, the body of Christ. If they don't respond to the guidance of his hand, the gospel of the good, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ, the gospel of if they reject it in unbelief, he takes that vessel of mercy and puts it back in the, vessel of, the vessels of wrath where they came from. And he goes through every individual, every one, every individual is a vessel of mercy. He's extending his mercy without limit to every single individual. Those who respond in faith to the guidance of his hand on that pottery wheel, uh, and he places that vessel of mercy then in his vessel of honor for today, the body of Christ. And this is where it gets really interesting. It's because uh, in Israel's prophetic program, he took those he justified and placed them into uh, Israel's a vessel, a, 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 he's going to turn Israel into a vessel of honor and place Jews within that. And he's going to put them in his display cabinet and his museum on earth to display his glory, to shed his light over the whole earth as a vessel of honor. But you know what he's doing today? And this is what Paul really wants these Jews to understand. What he's doing today is he's taking these vessels of mercy, those who receive the guidance of his hands in faith, he places in another vessel of honor, not the, not the, the nation of Israel, but the body of Christ. And guess what he's gonna do with that vessel of honor? He's gonna take it, when it and when it reaches its fullness, and completeness, and he's going to put that in the uh, display cabinet of his museum in the heavenlies. And that's the body of Christ, his, his vessel of honor, is going to display his glory throughout the heavenlies, throughout the whole universe. And this is uh, as viable for the Jews to come out of apostate nation. They can participate in it as readily as the Gentiles. Look what it says in verse 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. He's calling these individuals. What, what Paul desperately want them to realize is that they're just looking at it from the wrong angle now. They needed to realize that, yes, it's bad news that, that Israel has rebelled, Israel's rejected their Messiah. God has cast away national Israel uh, and his prophetic program with her. It's off the table. They can't be involved with that today. It's only temporary. In the future, he'll restart the program, but today it's not an option. But he says that's, that's not really bad news because now what God is doing, there's good news in that he's including Jews and Gentiles alike in an even bigger program and purpose than the one the, the Jews would have been involved in in Israel's prophetic program. Well, they're, can, they have uh, the opportunity to participate in the Body of Christ mystery program where God, whereby they'll not only display God's glory and break the power of Satan on earth, they'll display God's glory uh, and break the power of Satan in the heavenlies. God hasn't left the Jews or the Gentiles Hopeless. Of course, here he's emphasizing the Jews because that's the section we're in, uh, but it's for both. And they needed to realize, they need to stop thinking uh, that, uh, and stop thinking that Paul's message, stop fighting Paul, stop trying to discredit him. You see, uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to find reasons that they can get rid of Paul. They're saying, if what Paul's saying is true, uh, then God would be unfaithful, unrighteous, untruthful to Israel. And that's what he's answering here. Uh, and he should demonstrate that that's not the case. And what they need to stop doing now, they need to switch from the negative, rejecting his apostleship, and they need to embrace it. 
and they can be a part of something even bigger than Israel's prophetic program. That's the glory. How God in his enduring long suffering for his enemies is willing to do all that. It's amazing. And the more you learn about it, the more amazing it gets. While God has cast away his program of national Israel and they cannot participate in that, it's off the table. God is, hasn't just left, hung them out high and dry. He's inviting them to participate in another purpose that's even grander and greater. Today, God is calling uh, all sinners, Jews and Gentiles, putting all sinners, Jews and Gentiles alike, on his potter's wheel as vessels of mercy, just the recipient of his mercy. He's just going to work with each one and confront them with the gospel of grace. And they respond in faith. They, he, they become a part of the vessel of honor and that body of Christ. And they have, uh, they, he molds them with Pauline grace truth. You see that back from Romans six seventeen. And when they respond to this in faith, they are placed in the vessel of honor, uh, the body of Christ. And uh, I guess we'll close just by looking at those verses over in Ephesians 2. Another amazing, amazing passage. Uh, but we won't have time to develop it very much. But let's just see now. This is kind of summarizes everything we've been talking about. Pick it up at Ephesians 2. And you hath he quickened. Now, of course, here in Ephesians, he's especially addressing the Gentiles, right? In Romans 9, he's especially addressing Jews uh, from the standpoint of God's mystery program. Here he's especially uh, addressing the Gentiles. And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses. See, see that's our problem. We're dead in trespasses. We're born into the world dead. We're physically alive, but we're spiritually dead. That's the problem with fallen humanity. They're born into the world, ungodly sinners, on enemy status before God. That doesn't change till they, uh, the only way you, they can change that status, that position before God, is to believe his, new, his good news to them. Today it's the good news of uh, the, good, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ for us, for sinners. And when they do that, God credits their faith for righteousness and justifies them before his tribunal. And now they have a right standing before God, a reconciled standing before God, a right standing. Verse 2, wherein... In time past, you walked according to the course of the world. Remember, that's that ve those vessels of, uh, vessels of wrath. The Gentiles had just been handed over as vessels of wrath. God was, in time past, was just working with his vessel uh, of uh, honor and vessel of dishonor, the nation of Israel. And, but the Gentiles had been cast aside. He'd, he'd already, they've already declared their independence from God, their rebellion, and he let them go the way they wanted to go. Uh, and you walked in according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of error, that's uh, the satanic realm, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We're all children by nature of d the disobedience, the disobedience of Adam, among whom also we had our conversation in times past, uh, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of what? wrath, vessels of wrath. We belong to vessels of wrath, worthy of God's wrath and destruction. Even as others, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith, and we could, if we keep to the riches terminology, uh, we could say, but God who is rich in mercy for his greater rich in love because of his richness and love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us up, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. He takes now, he's got the vessels of mercy. He puts them on his pottery wheel. He shapes them with Pauline grace truth. He, he uh, uh, preaches to them, confronts them with the gospel of grace. They respond in faith. He puts them in the vessel of honor, the body of Christ united to Christ and God forevermore. And what's the purpose? He puts them in his museum in the heavenlies. And then what's the purpose? Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God today is using uh, the members of the body of Christ. He puts them in his heavenly display, uh, display case and museum. And there he shows the whole world comes and looks and they see the riches of his grace, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his long suffering, the riches of his kindness, the riches of his goodness, the riches of his glory. There's no better thing to be doing in the universe than that and the jews can participate in that uh, as just like the gentiles let's close with a word of prayer